Greetings, Journey Church, and welcome to the third and final installment of our 11 Letters message series. But before we begin today's message, let's play a final word game. We're going to give you five letters on the screen, and your job is to create five words that are each five letters long. No foreign or proper names are allowed. Think you've got what it takes? Let's put 30 seconds on the clock and see what you've got. On your marks, get set, go. Hey, put your phones down. No cheating. Come on, you've got this. And time's up. That was a tricky one, but probably not as hard as you thought. Here are the five possible words you could have unscrambled. Word one, least. Word two, slate. Word three, tails. Word four, stale. And word five, steel. If you got all five words, then congratulations. You're probably the type of know-it-all who annoys all your friends when watching trivia and game shows. But for the rest of you, it's time to drop in for the final week of 11 letters. Well, I just want to say that even if you didn't get all five of those words, you could still be the kind of person that annoys your friends when you play games. That is not the only test, but if you got all five of those words, way to go. You get absolutely nothing for it but the satisfaction that you're in the elite uh, of the universe. And so glad you're here. Jeremy mentioned earlier, we're on the last leg, last part of a three-part series called 11 Letters. And um, we started uh, two weeks ago, this will be the third week, uh, with a short one. We started slow so we could work our way up to it. And the first one was only two letters long. And it was a word that most of us became very familiar with at an early age, probably on or before our terrific twos started. For those of you who have two-year-olds, you laugh at that. And for everybody else, it's not a big deal. But it was the word no. And we didn't try to figure out that we should just say no, no more often or no to more people. We didn't find there was some great glory in the word no. As a matter of fact, we found out a week later that it's kind of a dangerous word. But here's what we did figure out. If we say no to lesser things, it will allow us to say yes to greater things. The reason we say no to lesser things is so we can say yes. It's not just saying no to horrible things, because most of us have an idea of that already. It is the reality that if we don't manage our no's, not no's, but N-O, apostrophe S, if we don't manage the word no well, we will miss out on the best things in life because life just gradually sneaks up on you. And then last week we ramped it up from two letters to three and we went with the word yes. And it wasn't just saying yes to people. It was the reality exactly what uh, Jeremy talked about just a minute ago when he was talking about that way in advance, God moved to a yes position for us. That before we knew we had a need, he saw a need and said yes. He said yes to you before there was a you. He said yes to you before you knew there was a need for his yes. And as people who have hope from him, our job is to live in a yes position toward other people. Now, I had a couple of you say to this to me uh, after last week's message. Say, Chris, the problem with that whole people thing is I don't like people. And I get it. I mean, I get why people sometimes don't like people. You know the reason? People. <laughs> it's not that hard. There's a lot of difficult, I mean, not me or not any of you, but there's people who go to other churches, and they're a problem. They're tough to deal with. There's humanity that gets in the way of saying yes to people. But as people who have hope, the only hope for a lot of people will come through God working through us, and it moves us to a yes position. There's room in my life for you. It's a yes. It's a challenge. It wasn't an easy discussion. 
And then today, but we're skipping four letter words all together because that just felt like we were headed down a horrible path. And so we're jumping that and the fact that if you count, we've used five and we've got 11 letters. So there's, I don't know, six, seven, eight letters left. And so today we're gonna hit on a word that is a word that I believe if we handled it well, could completely change how our lives work. It's a huge word, it's not really huge, it's only about that long, but it is a word that makes so much difference in our lives. Now, let's just start by saying this. Um, I talked to a guy not long ago, and when he was young, his neighbors asked him to do a favor for them. The neighbors had a fish and they had little children. It wasn't like a fish tank, like, you know, that holds 200 gallons. It was more of a fish bowl. But the fish in it, the little kids thought was like a part of the family. And they went away on vacation and they asked the teenage boy next door if he would feed the fish while they were gone. And so the first day he went over to the house, he unlocked the house, he went upstairs, he put a little of the fish food that they had left for the fish into the bowl and there wasn't much exciting about it. I mean, if you feed somebody's dog, at least there's a dog and it runs around and acts all happy to see you. The fish really didn't, it didn't respond at all. He kind of decided, because this is what teenage boys sometimes do, that this was inefficient use of his time. And he said, there's no possible way I'm coming over here every week, every day of the week, and feeding that stupid fish. And so what he did is he took the seven days worth of food and put it in the fish bowl. And he felt like, well, one, the fish isn't going to tell everybody. Two, they're never going to know the difference. And three, I'm not going to have to walk over there. It's a win, win, win. Who could not like that idea? And so he put all of the fish food in the fish bowl. And evidently, he, after he left, the fish, well, ate it all. And when the people came home, their fish was floating. Not floating in a good way, because fish floated a bit. But just floating right at the very top. And the, the little girl cried and they had to have a burial and couldn't just flush it because the girl saw it first and you can't do it after that. They went through all of those steps and they called the parents of the guy next door and they said, did you feed the fish? And he goes, heck yeah, I fed it. I fed every bit of the food you gave me. I don't understand it because the fish has never had any problem before and I think you may have killed our fish. And the problem with the fish, it wasn't his fault. The problem was the, with the fish is the fish didn't know when to stop eating. Now, I struggle with that in my life as well. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. That's why my wife never lays all seven days worth of food out on the table at once because she's afraid she'd come home and I'd be floating. And that would be an issue. But that is an issue of knowing when to stop. It's not just that. If you took a turtle and gave it a massive, it would probably eat till it couldn't eat. It's not a healthy way to live. It happens. As a matter of fact, it doesn't just happen with animals it happens in the people world too matter of fact there was a group in, at stanford university that did a study a bunch of years ago and they were studying how people eat their food and where do they draw the line of how much is the appropriate amount and so they set a big long table up they set a couple of people at this end they gave them a bowl of soup one each and they set a people a couple of people on this end they gave them one bowl each the only difference was these guys had a normal bowl of soup these guys had a bowl and underneath it was a tube that was affixed to the bowl and as the people would eat the soup it would refill the amount of soup and the test was would there be any difference in how much people consume well the answer was yes the couple of people over here and they ran the test over and over and on average ate about 73% less soup than the ones over here. And they had discussions going on and all of these things to distract. But the truth was people kept eating not till they were full. People kept eating till the volume of the soup went down or till eventually they realized, I haven't made a dent in this yet. And the problem is that often in life, one of the most difficult things to figure out is the word enough. How do we know when we have had enough? How do we know when anything is enough? And that is the six letters we have left is the word enough. Because we live in a world where enough is a very difficult discussion. The truth is the definition of enough, we can look it up and find words that define it, but defining enough in our life is very elusive. One of the reasons is because every time we think we get to enough, we find out that really wasn't enough. We just move the, the enough line. We move the, the touchdown line. We move where enough is in our life. Now, um, 
while back, I was studying to get certified to help counsel people in their finances. And as I was going through our classes, they began to talk about these three couples. They did a test and they were trying to teach us this great principle. And they said, first, we had a couple and this couple made $25,000 a year. And this couple had overspent or were in debt or were consuming about 10% more per year than they were bringing in. Now, if you're new to finances, that's called debt. See, if you bring in 25,000, 10%, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say it's about $2,500. And what happened to them is if you make 25,000 and spend 25, 27, 250, you're probably gonna decide you're in debt. Matter of fact, 10% of more than you make will cause you problems in the long run. But that's what was going on with them. Then there was a second couple, they made 50,000. They made $50,000 a year and they were falling behind and they were told to build a budget. These guys were told to build a budget. These guys were spending about 10% more than they brought in. So they had accrued some debt over the last couple of years. They were about $10,000. We call it overextended, right? And then there was a third couple. And this couple made $100,000 a year. And the problem was they had been spending about 10% more than they brought in. So they were about $10,000 in debt as a result of the last year. And so here was the thing. They said, we want you to build a budget. We want you to build a budget, you to build a budget. And when you're finished, tell us what you find out. Well, these guys built a budget. And what they said at the end is we don't have enough. That we cannot live on $25,000 a year. They said, well, what are you going to do? I don't know. Went to the second couple. The second couple said after they filled out their budget, we've tried everything we can. The truth is we cannot live on $50,000 a year. We need about 10% more. Third couple said, we cannot live on $100,000 a year. We need about 10% more. And so here was the big test. They said, if you took this guy's income, this couple's income, and you brought it down to here, and you said, can you live on $100,000 a year? They would say, of course we can. We would kill it. We would save. We would give. We would have so much more. It would be so perfect. Or if you ask this couple, could you live on $100,000? Yes, of course we could. But here's what statistics show. That if you gave the couple who had overspent 10% when they had 25000 within about two years, they would be spending about 10% more than their 100000 Because the issue wasn't how much they brought in. Their issue was they didn't have enough. And if you live beyond the line of enough, whatever you have, the line keeps moving. And you know, I've experienced that in my life. I've gotten an increase in my income, and I've been like, yes, that's exactly, that is, we've got it paid now. And by the end of the year, you're like, man, if we don't get a raise next year, I don't know what we're going to do. And they, I know the world gets more expensive, but in the end, it is determining that line of enough. Well, the little sketch for you, and it'll maybe get your mind thinking about a couple of things that you can take home with you. Let me show you the first one, and it, it kind of runs like this. And it has a first line coming up from the bottom, and we'll call that how much you have. That's the have line. That's what you already possess. And then there is another line up above it, and that's called the enough line. It's saying, here's what I have, but here's what I need, or this would be enough. And that gap in between is called the discontentment zone. Maybe you would call it the frustration zone. Now, a lot of us live with that every day. It's like, I have this, but if I had this, I would be okay. And the gap between is the how much frustration. If it is a gap this big, you're super frustrated or discontented. If it's this big, you may be less frustrated or discontented. But that is the way life works. Certainly, it's the way life works in the area of money. Well, let me show you the flip side of, of that graph would look like this. It says that I'm going to draw a line, and we're going to determine that this is enough. Irregardless, as a matter of fact, we're going to put enough here and we're going to put what we have here. And the gap between enough and what we have is called happiness. Maybe it would be called contentment. For some people, that would be called the generosity zone. Because that frees us up to do with our money what helps the most. The problem is to do that, you have to determine an enough and live within that parameter. 
and that is very difficult to do. As a matter of fact, in our country, we may be the wealthiest society as a whole that there's ever been, and here's the crazy reality. Between zero and 1% is what the average American gives as an act of generosity. See, zero is bad. <laughs> That's really low. If you don't understand numbers well, zero is not a good number. 1% is pretty sad. Now, here's the reality. Often we think if we had more, we would be more generous, but statistics tell us just the opposite about that as well. Actually, the people who give the greatest percentage of their income are not the super wealthy. As a matter of fact, the more wealth you have, the trend moves downward. I know every now and then we'll hear about somebody giving like a bazillion dollars away. And so that happens. But by and large, as wealth increases, generosity decreases as a percentage of our income. You know who normally does the best? Blue-collar Americans who struggle and fight to maintain a decent lifestyle. That's usually the most generous people in our world. And the reason is because that more doesn't always mean more happy. Often it just means more stress. Well, there's a guy in the Bible who is the most beautiful example of this enough thing that I think we ever find. His story is found in Luke chapter 19. We'll look at it together real quick. Perhaps if you've been around church, this is a cat you've heard of before. If you haven't, you may have even heard about him just because the story is so popular. Maybe we can find a couple of new angles on it this morning. Luke 19 says, Jesus entered Jericho and he made his way through the town. And there was a man there, and here's the introduction to our, our guy. His name was Zacchaeus. If you've heard of him, you've probably heard something bad about him that no, no guy would ever want to have said about him because uh, they make up songs about him and it's painful. He met this guy named Zacchaeus, and he was, was the timing of that right? Four sentences from now, you'll decide. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. So in the first little run-up on this, we find out his name, and we find out a lot about him. He was a chief tax collector, not just a regular tax collector. Jesus met a guy once named Matthew. He was just run-of-the-mill tax collector. This guy, Zach, was the high end of that. He was in charge of that. He was over the run of the mill guys. So we find out that and it says he was very rich, so he's very good at what he did. We know those two things for sure about him. Now in his day, the problem was he was from a place called Israel, but Israel had been taken over by Rome. It would be like for us as Americans, if China takes over, we're gonna be ticked. If they took over, we would feel like, what the heck are you doing in our world telling us what to do? Well, Rome, when it took over places, decided there was a good strategy. They didn't run everybody out of town. They didn't exile everyone. They didn't slaughter everyone. They decided the best thing we could do with people is we could tax them and we'll take their money and use it. This is what's crazy. There was a day when powerful and influential people decided that taxing people to get more of their money so they could have greater power was a good thing. Aren't you glad we're past that? We have come a long way, baby. So what they would do if they were going to tax people, they didn't have every employer sending documentation of what you made. And so they would choose locals, people from Israel, to stand as their representative. You know why? Because that guy could say, hey, that dude over there, he has like 500 cattle and 300 sheep and all that. He should be taxed more because he knew they needed an insider. And so they would hire locals to stand on behalf of Rome to take their own people's money away and give to the enemy. It was, if you were that guy who owned all of that stuff, evidently he lives over here because that's where we wanted, that guy would come to the insider guy that was now the sellout to Rome, and he would say, dude, don't tell him I own all that stuff because that's going to cost me a fortune. And then the insider sellout guy would say, but dude, they're going to want your money but I don't want to give them my money. Well, I'll tell you what I can do. I've got a son, got to go to private school. Those schools aren't very good around here. And it costs me a fortune to put him in private school. So I'll tell you what I'll do. If you give me a little something, something, I will not tell them that you have a lot of something, something, and this will all work out. And he would say, so I'll give you that, so you'll shut up. It was like the mob back in the early days. It's how it worked. So there was Zacchaeus. You know who hated him? All the locals. You know who else hated him? Rome. You know why? Because he ripped off everybody. You know who didn't hate him? His kids. They went to a really good school. 
That's the way the story plays out. So that's the guy, and he was really good at it, and he had become very rich. And then there's this weird story around him. It says that he, one day, he tried to get a look at Jesus, but because he was a little vertically challenged and couldn't see over the crowd, so he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, where Jesus was going to pass that way. So the story is this, the really rich guy, which by the way, really rich guys in that day wore really expensive robes. They had really nice stuff. They didn't run because running has bad optics. You don't want to be seen as that guy, and they sure as heck didn't climb a tree. But there was something about this Jesus guy that had so clicked in his heart that he said, I got to see if he is who everybody says he is. And I got some vertical issues. And so he ran ahead, which no one would have ever done. He climbed up in a tree. He climbed up into a sycamore fig tree, which was often so full of leaves that maybe you couldn't see somebody. And so he kind of hid up there, but he wanted a better vantage point. And that's where Jesus comes along. And when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus, trying to kind of hide from the crowd and catch a view. And he called him by name, which this is a bummer if you're Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Jesus is walking by and he goes, well, I mean, there's a vertical chalice, man, in the tree. You don't see that every day, do you? I sure don't. And he said, Zacchaeus, get, why don't we go to your house? Whatever has prompted all this attention, I'd love to spend a minute with you. Let's go to your house. And so just like that. Zacchaeus could have gone, what man in a tree? There's no man in a tree. I don't know what you're talking about. But instead, it says Zacchaeus quickly climbed down. He took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He's gone to be the guest of the notorious sinner, they grumbled. Back in that day, often whatever happened, there were people ticked off about it. They were like tweeting and Snapchatting and Instagramming, and they're like, can you believe it? Because sometimes people in that day got all ticked off no matter what happened. <laughs> Thank heavens we've outlived that one too. I can't believe he would go there. He didn't just go to a bad person. He went to that person. And we hate that person. It happened to Jesus a lot. I'll tell you the truth though. It just says all the people or the people. Usually it says what people. And there were these religious people. This time it doesn't give any clarification. This ticked off everybody. I mean, this ticked off the Republicans and the Democrats and the independents and the people who don't know what all that means. Everybody was mad. And I don't know what happened when he got to their house, to Zacchaeus' house, but something. Maybe he went and checked out his house and he was looking at his garage and he goes, man, I love your refrigerator. Like you can email from my refrigerator. How cool is that? Because you never need to know while you're getting milk out if you need to send an email, for instance. And look at how many bathrooms, how much square footage. Maybe that's what they did. But somewhere down the line, as they, was, as they were looking at all this stuff, something must have come up, because we don't get the whole conversation, but we know the result of the conversation is something happened in Zacchaeus. It makes you wonder if somewhere in there Jesus didn't say, man, you have really come a long way. Is it what you hoped for? Is this working out as well as you thought it would? Zacchaeus, why are you up in the tree, dude? You got all this, what are you missing that would make you do that? And I don't know what it was like for Zacchaeus. I suspect there was a day when he came from not much, because that would who that's who would usually do that kind of job. Is somebody who saw the bright lights and the possibilities. And maybe he didn't have he walked everywhere because <laughs> he didn't have a donkey. And then he started doing his job and he got a donkey. I was like, yes. And then he realized I'm riding a donkey. I'm better than this. And so he saved up because he made a lot of money off other people's stuff. And he bought a camel. Camel was like the Hummer of its day. We could go anywhere. Very economical. When you had a camel, it was a pretty big deal. But you know, sooner or later, the new camel smell wore off. <laughs> You're like, eh. And so you bought maybe a two-hump camel. Because those were kind of up in, plus they have a great car seat for the kids, I guess. And then maybe he bought a second one, and maybe he traded in his old nasty robes for new silk robes, and then maybe one day he figured out he was a winter, and all of his tongues were earth tongues. 
all his robes were earth, earth tones and he couldn't wear those anymore. And so he bought better robes until finally he had closet. He built a bigger house so he could have more places to hang his robes. Because back in that day, people did stuff like that. And then one day he must have decided that I sure have a lot of stuff. And he moved from his house to a bigger house, to suburbia house. Then he bought one out on the river, Jordan River. Had a big place with a big spread. And then one day he must have figured out something because they put him up a tree looking for Jesus. So they ate. Somewhere in their conversation, Jesus must have told them, I wonder if you're, if you're not satisfied, if you might be willing to kind of surrender all of this stuff and follow me. To which you would think Zacchaeus would go, yeah, I'll get back to you on that. But he didn't. Meanwhile, the verse says Zacchaeus stood, because typically people did this at the end of a big dinner, give a little speech. But he didn't give a big speech. He stood before the Lord and he said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. To which Zacchaeus' kids went, Daddy said, what? <laughs> Whoa, Mrs. Zacchaeus had to be going. I don't believe we've discussed that. <laughs> Half of my wealth I'll give to the poor. And then it goes a lot further. He said, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, let's just stop for a minute and laugh at that. <laughs> just in case I might have cheated somebody, which is all he did, I will pay them back four times as much. He says, listen, I'll follow. I'll sacrifice all, and I'll follow. Jesus' response could have been a lot of things. The words he says don't even make sense when I was glancing. I'm like, oh, I didn't expect to see that. Jesus' response with these words, salvation has come to this home today. Salvation has come. He didn't pray a prayer. He didn't get baptized. He didn't do some great religious thing. Salvation, often the word in the New Testament we see for that is the word healing. What Jesus said is the sickness of not enough. Today you found the antidote. You let go. Salvation has come to this house today. For this man has shown himself, and then he used this little phrase that means nothing to most of us, to, to be a true son of Abraham. See, what he did when he became the guy that he was, is he kind of screwed over everybody from his lineage. He was the outcast now. What Jesus said, he could have said anything, and it wouldn't have been as much as this, because Abraham was everything. He said, you know what you are? You're one of us. That whatever you've done, my healing is bigger than that. However you've messed up, this is bigger. And this day, you're truly a son of Abraham. It's just weird all of the things that can happen. But for him, around this issue of money, he had to draw a line of enough. That without the line, I've never found satisfaction. And the only way I'm going to find it is I'm going to have to learn that enough is here and what I have is here. And in between is where I find contentment. And that's also where I find Jesus. Because often what I look for in other things, I leave Jesus out of the picture. For most of us, money is a thing. It may not be just the thing, but it is a big deal. Matter of fact, we finish the service most of the time and we take up an offering. And a piece of that is literally a step of faith. The Bible calls that a giving a tithe, a, a, a percentage. Maybe it would be a better way for us to give a percentage that we determine in advance by faith. We literally say, I will trust God for what I have more than I'll just trust what I can get. There's an old parable told in, in the recovery world for those who have dealt with uh, addiction to something and been in the recovery world. Often it's shared, and it's about a guy who was drunk and he struggled with alcohol for years. He didn't struggle with it, and he just beat it. It wasn't a struggle. He had lost. And one day he was drunk and walking along, and he met God, which if you're drunk, you never know who you're going to meet. He met God, and he said, I can't live this way anymore. I need sobriety, God. I'll do anything. And God said, you'll do anything? I'll do anything. He said, okay, I'll take it away from you. It was great. And God said, well, what it's going to take is I need all your money. And the guy reaches in his wallet and goes, well, I have $50. Here's my $50. And God said, well, okay, thank you. Yeah, I said, well, I love this, and I, I'm willing to give everything I have. He said, my only question is, if I give you my $50, how am I going to put gas in my car? And God said, you have a car? Yeah, I have a, 
Well, you'll need to give me that. And the guy goes, well, I guess that part of giving everything, he gives him his keys. And he says, the only problem I got, if I give you $50 and I give you my car, how am I going to be able to get to work? The guy said, you have a job? You need to give me that. Says, well, all right, I'll give you my money, my car, my job. But if I don't have my money, my car, and my job, how will I pay my mortgage? Mortgage? You got a home? Well, I'll need that. He said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. But if I don't have any money or my car or my house, then how will I care for my family? Family. You need to give me that. And he finally said, well, I don't have anything else. And God said, well, then perfect. We're in just the right spot. And he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you use of my car and my house and my home and my family. And you just take good care of it. And the truth is, that's what following Jesus was intended to be. It was literally surrendering what we have because we trust that it's his in the first place. The Bible says the earth and all of its contents are his. And he allows us to use that somewhere we've decided that what I have is mine. And whatever I have that's mine will never be enough. But he just says, I am enough. You'll trust me or you'll trust it. But you'll have to choose. It's a tough choice sometimes. Money seems very tangible, and God seems very far away. Well, maybe money is a, a big problem. I just challenge this. If you've never trusted God with that, I would just challenge you to try. We say this around here a lot. I've said it for the last 20 years of my life. I challenge you to say, God, I will give first things to you. I will set aside this portion of my income, and I'll give it to you, and I'm going to trust that you can do more with the rest than I can do with all. But even if you don't, I'm going to trust you. Because I can't find that line of enough by myself. But maybe money's not the only spot to do that. One of the things I've bumped into, and this is kind of where we'll close things down for this morning. One of the things I've bumped into all through my life, and I, I hope none of you struggle with this, this may just be true confessions for me. If it is, you guys just pray for me. But I suspect there's one or two or most that somewhere bump into this. Sometimes I, in the moment, I keep thinking, matter of fact, we'll just put it up here on the screen. It may not make sense when you first see it. I often say this, if, and then I have some words that follow, if I can just get to that, if I can just get past that, or maybe it'll be when. When we just get the kids out of diapers, I remember saying that one. My prayer was I'd get them out of diapers before I was in them, you know. Some of you are in that spot right now. Not the diapers, but the getting the kids out on both. Who are we to judge? But when? When we can just get them through that? If we can just get them all to that? We can just get them so they can drive and I don't have to take them everywhere? That was a crazy thought. Then if we can just get them off of our payroll, off of my insurance? Man, that was a day. But often we have those things. If we can just get to that point, if we can just get over that hill, if we can just finally settle into a home, for some people it's a lot deeper than that. For some people it is, if I could just find someone because I feel so alone, and I'm tired of being alone. Man, that's a real feeling. And it's almost this belief, if I could find someone, I'd finally be happy. I don't blame you. If you're in that spot today, I don't blame you for feeling that way. I guess I would just warn you that no, you don't. You know why? Because I talk to people every day and they say, if I could just get out of this relationship, I'd be happy. And I would say this, no, you don't. If the person you find is what's going to make you happy, you sure place the heavy load on their shoulders. The happiness I can't find anywhere else in the universe, I'm counting on you to find. That relationship's going to go well. We do it every day. I did it. Sometimes we do it with a job or a purchase or a thing. The truth is, if you can't find contentment single, you probably won't find it happy. If you can't find it married, you probably won't find it single. If you can't find it in the job you're in, I know there's some really bad jobs, and I get it. And I know there's some abusive places, and I know. I'm not counting that. But typically, if you can't find contentment where you are, you're not going to find it because it's not in any of those places. 
that outside of Jesus, you're not going to find it. You know why? Because you ignore the new him. And whatever you fill in those blanks, if only we could do that. By the, if we could get that, I'll be contented. If when we get past that, whatever you put in that blank, you, that's what you've used to take God out of that blank. And all God ever said is, if you would come to me, I will give you life. I'll give it life to its maximum. The life you're hoping for and looking for, you'll not find it. And even sometimes after we say to God, I'll sacrifice, I'll hand it all back to you, our tendency is to start grabbing it back and little by little to find ourselves in the same spot. So what about you? If I were to say to you, if there's one thing in your life that could happen and you feel like I would really be happy, what is the thing? Just challenge you today. Would you take a little while and think through that? If you have a significant other in your life somewhere, have that discussion. What is it that we think if we can just get to that, we're going to be happy? And when you figure that out, be honest enough to say it's not going to make us happy. Free enough is a very elusive thing. But if you can ever find that there is freedom, there is freedom like crazy. Because enough is found in Jesus. So God, help us today. As easy as it is to talk about it on a Sunday, it is so hard to live it out. And while I'm excited for these guys finding that, I want to live that every day of my life. The truth is, outside of you, there is not enough. And without you, I'll never find it. So help me live like a person who has been introduced to the enough in my life. And when you head me into that, is my only hope for content. Thanks for giving us an example of a wee little dude who found the answer.